Well, good evening. Raise this just a little bit here. Good evening, and welcome to Cole's Library. My name is Shirley Portner, and I am uh, chair of the National Advisory Board for Cole's Library. We're delighted to have you here this evening. How many of you were able to attend um, the first live at uh, the Drake Library series that we had back on April 1 with Dr. Uh, Mike Marty? How many of you were here for that? Well, quite a few, so welcome back. The majority of you, though, it appears were not able to attend that first session, so we are glad that you were able to come here tonight and attend this session. It is going to be every bit as wonderful as the first one, I'm, I know. The uh, Live at uh, Drake Library series has a number of goals. One of those, obviously, is to promote Cole's Library, to, pr to promote the library. And your attendance here tonight and filling this room is, is evidence that 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 is definitely working. Another one of the goals is to uh, promote the expanding role of libraries and, and just information technology in general in our society today. And so we're going to have a, a number of different topics and that are going to hit on all those different ways in which libraries and information technology is impacting our lives. And then, of course, another goal by having this Live at the Drake Library series is to um, gain support from all of you for these kinds of initiatives. So I really encourage you, if you've not already done so, to pick up one of these interest cards out on the table in the atrium where you're able to indicate that you'd like to make sure you're on the mailing list, that you'd somehow or other like to contribute with your time or your resources. So I encourage you to pick up one of these blue cards out there. It's my pleasure now to uh, introduce uh, Drake University Provost Dr. Ron Troyer. Dr. Troyer joined the Drake faculty in 1980, became Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences in 1994, and has been the university's chief academic officer since July 1, 2000. But from my perspective, most importantly, since I've known Dr. Troyer, he's been just a great champion of the library and all that the library does to uh, make Drake Library what it is today. And we certainly appreciate all of his support. So, to get the, uh, the, the evening going, please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Ron Troyer. Thank you, Shirley. One of the disadvantages of being provost is that you get asked to make these ceremonial appearances at a variety of events that you would never attend otherwise. <laughs> and after you introduce the speaker, you wonder, how am I going to stay awake for the next uh, hour and a half as the person labors? When Rob contacted me about this evening, the response on my part was very different. It was genuine enthusiasm. I fake it often when the other deans call and say they want me to introduce somebody. I've really been looking forward to this evening because we're privileged to have a very special guest. Uh, Judy Ann Richardson is head of the largest collection, largest collection of African American oral histories in the United States. For those of you who have not followed oral history, it's really a wonderful way of capturing the experience of people who often have been neglected and whose story has not been heard in what we would uh, describe as official history or the dominant history. Judy Ann Richardson graduated from Brandeis University in 1976 with a BA in Theater Arts and American Studies. I've often wondered uh, what happens to graduates in theater, and now I know some of them actually are successful. She first experienced the power of oral histories during the time she was at Brandeis when she conducted some independent research on the Harlem Renaissance. In 1980, she received her Juris Doctorate from Harvard Law School, then worked as a corporate lawyer 
for Jenner and Black prior to serving in the early 1980s as the cable administrator for the city of Chicago's Office of Cable Communications. She went on to found Shop Chicago, a regional bass shopping channel, and for eight years her teleproduction company, SCTN, managed three local TCI channels. You don't know how tempting it was for me to omit, omit any reference to a shopping <laughs> network. It's not one of my favorites, but we'll forgive you. Uh, in 1999, she founded the History Makers. And I want to encourage every one of you here, if you haven't done it, get on the web. Look at the website and explore some of the possibilities there. I was going to take five minutes to do it. I ended up with half an hour on the website today exploring this. I'm going to be going back because there's so many interesting and valuable things there. This has quickly grown. I bet it's grown beyond what she ever expected. The History Makers is a national nonprofit educational institution based in Chicago, committed to preserving, developing, and providing easy access to an internationally recognized archival collection of thousands of African American oral histories. In addition to serving as executive director of the History Makers, Ms. Richardson also serves on the board of directors of Lawyers for Creative Arts. Chicago Convention and Business Bureau. I'm really looking forward to what we're going to experience next. Welcome to Drake University, Julianne. Thank you. That was a lovely introduction, thank you. <laughs> um, I often have to explain uh, why um, home shopping was part of my path. <laughs> Uh, especially in academic uh, circles and library and archives, you don't have to sort of slip through that, but I always say all paths have led me to where um, my passion is right now, and that is creating the nation's largest African-American video history archive. Um, as you see, I have a, a very eclectic background, um, one that uh, is very committed to the telling of stories, one that was actually uh, started when I was student at Brandeis um, doing research on the Harlem Renaissance and uh, Langston Hughes. And I often tell people, as I told some students here today, that I remember uh, being a, um, a student um, in third grade when uh, the teacher asked me, uh, or asked all the students, and I was in a small town in Ohio called Newark, Ohio, and the only black in my classroom, um, asked me to uh, or ask all of us what our backgrounds were, and you know, people are part German, part you know English. You know, they knew theirs, and I, being somewhat embarrassed because at that point all that we had uh, studied was slavery, which that was not anything that someone would aspire to be, and and. Um, George Washington Carver, and it was it hard for a young student to think that George Washington Carver had done all those things with peanuts when all of that black people had been their slaves. And I spin myself uh, forward to the time that I was um, doing research um, in the, what I call the treasure trove of, a, of the Schomburg Library in New York and found that the songwriting team had of um, um, oh, Honey and Coles, um, had uh, done the song, um, I'm Just Wild About Harry, probably, you be blank. And, um, and I, that opened up a whole new world for me because I learned the richness of African American history. And I would say that that is where my path started, really, at that point. Now, back in, um, I started the project in um, June of 1999, and I have to say at that point in time that um, I was really at a crossroads. Someone asked me uh, today what, what, what made me want to start this. I was in a, a crossroad, call it a midlife crisis, whatever. And I didn't have children, and really, you, know, you get to a point in your life where you want to leave a legacy. 
And in those, in those early years, you know, a friend of mine had been uh, telling me, because she was general counsel for our PBS station, about our PBS station throwing away uh, their material and that she was also trying to index what they had. And um, she would come home, you know, talking about it, and I was really trying to figure out what I wanted to do because th the thought of practicing law again was not really practical. I'd been out, I'd done this home shopping thing, I'd been working in government. And I attended, this was the year that Clarence Thomas was um, um, nominated, and the, the National Bar Association had a meeting in Memphis, and it was a very contentious meeting. And I remember going and hearing uh, Reverend Billy Kyles, who was on the, um, the balcony when Martin Luther King was shot, and a woman named uh, Constance Baker Motley. And I was thinking, you know, at, at that point in time, because she had been talking a lot about archives, and, and, um, and I remember thinking at the time that people did not know these names, but they knew about Martin Luther King. And the name came to me at the time, the History Makers, and I came back to Chicago and I said, Catherine, I know what I want to do. It's called the History Makers, and it's an African-American archive. And she's like, that makes no sense. <laughs> and that was the general feeling. Um, and I would, as I, in that, in that period of the summer of 1999, when I was trying to transition um, from managing several local cable channels, I um, would talk, go to people, and you know, be at cocktail receptions, telling them what I'm, you know, wanting to do, and they would look at me like I had really lost my mind. So, what what I did in those early years was really in very loyally fashion, do my due diligence. Um, and there are some amazing things that I found out, which I will share with you. But I want to say just one thing before I show a video clip. In the early years. Um, I was trying to balance off well-known and unsung. Um, well-known, so people would have some sense that we were doing something important, but I was, uh, unsung. And I, one day I was getting ready to interview a Colonel Thompson. I knew that he had been a Tuskegee Airman. I didn't know much about him, and I was sort of dragging myself to the interview. I got there, and Colonel Thompson had spent four days preparing for us. He had boxes and boxes of photographs. And he had been really the chief documenter, documentarian of the 98th Squadron, uh, the famous one. And he sits me down and he says, have you heard about the Golden 13? And I said, no, Colonel Thompson, I have not heard about the Golden 13. And he said they were the Navy's version of the Tuskegee Airmen. And there are four left living in this country. One lives upstairs, and he would like to talk to you also. And it was at that moment that I felt and knew that we were on the, the right track, on the process of discovery of what is really very little known African American history. And with that, I would like to just, if we can um, turn, turn down the lights. I want to play this. Okay, first of all, how, um, it's, I had um, actually had a clip that I couldn't show, um, and it's in about an eight minute clip that shows different parts of our interviews, but we'll see it. We'll see some of that uh, with this presentation. What is a history maker? A history maker we've defined as someone who's African American by descent who has made significant accomplishments in his or her own life or associated with a particular movement, organization, association, or event in time that's important to the African American community. Now, what I, I want to just um, start out by saying that um, what our goal was is really to document 20th century African American life and culture as told by the first person. And you can't say that every Tuskegee Airman or Pullman Porter was this great and marvelous person, but they represent a place um, or um, uh, a particular movement or organization that was important to the telling of our, our history. Now, the significance of this is that there's only been once in the history of the United States that there's been a massive attempt to record our experiences told by the first voice. And that was with the slave narratives. And uh, for those of you who don't know, between the years of 1936 and 38, there were actually 2,300 former slaves interviewed as part of the WPA movement. 
Um, that collection is important in the absence of anything else because the slaves were old when they were recorded and young uh, when slavery ended. And most of the recordings were hand transcribed interviews. Um, there were some audio cassette interviews and those are precious and you know, allow the person to hear the human voice. Um, what we're essentially trying to do with the history makers is document 20th century because that is 19th century African American history and some people will, will argue that it's the abolitionist version of history. And there's some interesting things, there's been some studies and you know scholars are still looking at studying some of uh, that material. But what we say is that our stories are stories of success against the odds, achievement in the face of adversity, in all cases stories of inspiration and we consider ourselves America's missing stories. Now, what is the goal? Our goal is to create an archival collection of 5,000 African American video history, oral histories. Now, we also want to take traditional oral, oral histories and combine them uh, with state of the art technology. Um, and um, so it's a combination of oral history and public history, but create a unique digital archive. And we want to preserve this for generations to come. Now, someone was talking to me earlier, the largest um, video oral history collection by far that will exist anytime in the foreseeable future is the Spielberg Shaw Foundation project. And Spielberg, in five years after he had done Schindler's List, was moved to record um, the stories of remaining Holocaust survivors. There were actually 150,000 living at the time. They did 52,000 interviews over a five-year period, 100 million spent. 6,000 people worked on the project, 4,000 of which were volunteers. Their average interview was about three hours, which is ours. The longest interview was 17 hours. Um, they had a very sophisticated shipping operation. Um, it is called, what they did though, is, is what in oral history terms is called subject matter oral histories. We are doing life oral histories, and that's basically taking someone throughout uh, their life. Um, we, in the early years, actually, I consulted with the Shaw Foundation um, because they are the most similar thing to what we have. Now, our collection is, you know, small compared to, the, to theirs, but it's a very significant collection, and actually, we stand as the nation's largest at a thousand interviews. La next to us is the uh, Schomburg Library, where I, which I spoke of, and um, uh, the Birmingham Civil Rights Museum. The Schomburg Library, it took them 20 years to build their collection. Howard Dodson has been a friend and supporter of ours from the beginning. And the Birmingham Civil Rights Museum, a woman named Odessa Wolfick started that, and it took them 10 years to build their collection. We've done what we've done in about a four and a half year period. As I said, we were incorporated June of 1999. I developed a concept paper. The thought of trying to do a business plan or whatever was really overwhelming because at the time I didn't know really much about archives or libraries or you know the educational arena um, or documentary film production. Um, we started that first year um, doing 70 interviews. We started in February of 2000, and so by the end we uh, did 70 interviews that uh, first year. As you see, we just started there in Chicago. Now, there were several things that were <coughs> milestones. I mean, I didn't know how to get my hand around this um, at the beginning. And um, I did some <coughs> important research. Um, like I said, I gathered a group of students together. And I had done some interviews. And we sat down and looked at them. And I also did a lot of research <coughs> um, on the internet and, and looking at different African American organizations and um, holdings, and there were some surprising finds um, along the way. Um, out of the 200 black newspapers in this country, um, only three of them have archives, and none of them are indexed. Um, you have um, the Chicago Defender in Chicago, the uh, Philadelphia Tribune, and the Afro-American, um, 
And the, there was also the Pittsburgh Courier that existed that had a very valuable collection, but that sort of disappeared over the weekend. We don't know what happened to it, but when the defender uh, purchased the Pittsburgh Courier, that collection disappeared. You do have the collection of Johnson Publishing, but you, no one can get access to it right now, but they have a very important um, photo collection uh, starting in the 1940s. Um, I do want to say something about, though, the, the history of oral histories in this country. It's a, it started really in the 1940s also. Um, really, um, oral histories with the province of the rich. Um, and so the, the, it started with a gentleman who housed himself um, at Columbia University, and Columbia University still today houses sort of the Cadillac or Rolls Royce of oral history. Um, and, um, and so they were interviewing people like Winston Churchill and, you know, leaders at the time. It was only when you got to the 70s that um, oral histories became popularized. And, and so, um, and we start looking at things like, you know, the Great Migration or, you know, um, other, you know, subject matters that were sort of more populous and, and people oriented. And there were, was some important funding that came out of the Library of Congress at that time. Um, but what, um, and a lot of that, those interviews were audio cassette interviews. It's just recently with the advent of video that you see video being used. Now, there were some important milestones. One, people didn't know what we were doing. Um, I was very animated and people knew I was excited. Um, I knew that I needed to raise, uh, based just on planning, $30 million. It's a huge amount for someone who is an unknown, not affiliated with anyone, though I tried at the beginning to be affiliated with the University of Chicago, uh, with the Center for Race, Politics, and Culture. And, and um, so in that early period of time, the issue was how did we get the word out about what we were doing? And um, one of the things um, we were advised, it was one of my advisors who's been a trustee advisor, was do an event, <laughs> do a PBS program. So, you know, I liked, um, my favorite program was Bravo Inside the Actor's Studio. I love that program. And it's all about sort of storytelling, and I fe felt that was very close to our mission. So we launched um, in 2000, the fall of 2000. So you see we're moving sort of quickly, but we launched and had an event that has been an annual sort of celebrity series, but we had Danny Glover interviewing Harry Belafonte that year, and we filled up the Art Institute Auditorium, we had a thousand people in attendance. Um, and people, it struck people, the sort of telling of the story, people did not uh, know of Harry Belafonte's uh, background, they did not know that he sort of single-handedly funded a lot of the civil rights movement, um, paid for the King children to go to school, um, and so that was all very, and he's a very engaging speaker, and it was, it, it sort of captivated the audience. The other thing is that we were, you know, of our grants, because people have asked me, you know, I, of the 30 million, I've raised 3.5 million, which sometimes in archivist circles sounds like a lot of money. <clears throat> but projects like these, you know, are very expensive, and I'll go into a little bit more of that uh, later. Um, our largest grant to date has been this $240,000 grant that we got from the Knight Foundation. And as part of the grant, um, we actually interviewed African Americans in different of the Knight uh, cities. Uh, we were blessed also to um, um, have a, a supporter in the state, in a state senator named Emil Jones. And we actually debuted um, a project where we were documenting um, African Americans in the Illinois General Assembly. This was a fascinating project to a lot of people, and it pointed to the importance of archives. Um, I, in my, you know, very eager and enthusiastic way, told him I could take a brochure and bring it to life. Little did I know in looking at that there was no biographical information on all of the 115 people that it served. This history went back to 18, um, 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 1879. And it started with a gentleman named John W. Thomas, who was born a slave, who ran against Robert Todd Lincoln. Um, after the Chicago fire, there, you know, there was something called the Fireproof Party. And he actually won. He won uh, against President Lincoln's son um, and uh, became the first African-American uh, member of the state legislature. And he 
Um, he passed one of the first uh, of the nation's first civil rights legislation back in 1879. What is interesting about this is it took, you know, up until the modern day civil rights movement to get those rights back that had been taken away back from Reconstruction. Um, it was this was also important because we needed the we needed the archives of the Defender. I mean, no one was covering Black history back then except Black newspapers, and so um, luckily as luck would have it, um, there was a local historian who had spent four years in the Defender Archives looking at everything, and he helped us out in pulling together a lot of this history. Um, in June of 2002, we were actually named a special collection as part of the state library system. Uh, we have done a lot of important work in taking our um, edge our material and creating actually uh, what is now called the History Makers Education Institute. Um, back in 2002, the Wyndham Hotel, you know, we had just been doing the Knight Foundation grant. The Wyndham Hotel gave us some unprecedented number of 160 room nights, which is huge. We brought history makers in from all over the country. We got AT&T broadband to give us a computer lab. Um, we had history makers and students and teachers, and it was really just magical. Out of that, several educators who were quite moved uh, by the experience they, that day came and talked to us about creating a year-long program. And we have launched that program uh, with money from MacArthur uh, Foundation and several institutions. Um, tonight, I'm actually here to show you our digital archive, and I'll talk about that uh, later. It's, um, I consider Professor Walkler, who has created a system called uh, the Infomedia Digital Video Library, our, our godfather in many ways. Um, he worked uh, for eight years with licensed footage from the Department of Defense and the National Science Foundation and has developed this unique uh, searchable digital archive. Um, who are we now? We're a th we will end the year, as I said, with a thousand um, interviews. Uh, we actually have interview teams that have traveled more than 50 cities around the country. We have regional offices in, in Washington, D.C. We're located at Howard University at uh, the PBS station there. And in Atlanta, Atlanta has been an amazing city for us. Uh, just started this year. Uh, we launched the city with one of our celebrity interviews, an evening with Della Reese um, that we did at the PBS station there. But more importantly, um, the National Historic, the Martin Luther King Historic Site that's run by the National Park Service has given us our own shotgun house on Sweet Auburn Avenue, right across from the Martin Luther King uh, birthplace. And we have our own little two-bedroom apartment that we can stay in and I can send crews. Uh, we've been doing interviews this year in Cleveland, San Francisco, and Boston. Um, this is our coverage area. So you see we have made tremendous progress since that first, those first set of 70 interviews. Um, we are still weak on the western part of the United States. Um, it's very important for us now to nationalize our collection by regionalizing our efforts, and that's what we're all about. And it's the creation or trying to develop that important infrastructure with basically minimal resources. Um, where are we going? We want to do 5,000 video art histories by 2008. Uh, we need $30 million, or you know what's left of, let's say, $27 million to do that. And also, where is it going to reside long term? I mean, the traditional archive, you have a place, uh, which we have, and you know, scholars come to us and they look at our archives. But in the future, um, what our hope is that we'll have a digital archive and we're actually, that's the new thought that you will take it and open it up to the world. Um, this is how we plan to get there, um, to build with the last year really uh, doing 2,000 interviews in one year, but it's very important that we build that infrastructure. Uh, we, training procedures, setting up, you know, and I was talking to uh, the staff at, at Cole's Library today about it's very important that you set up processes. And I know that, you know, here at the university, you're looking at documenting Drake University history. And oral history is just, it's a wonderful, wonderful way of getting to know things, of bringing out the history, of keeping that history alive. And with video, you can see the twinkling in someone's eye, their smiles, their frowns, that type of thing. Um, 
So in January, we actually brought people in from across the country who were interested in doing interviews and had a week-long uh, training program, and we've been testing people out. This um, just shows you our funding to date. Um, we've had to do a lot of special events uh, from non-traditional sources. That has been you know, a hard way to sort of uh, raise things, but we've raised, as I said, $3.5 million uh, to date. Now, what are our, our products and services? We have the History Makers website, um, the Education Institute, which I've talked about, the Speakers Bureau that we're starting, and then programming and live events. Our website is a success story in and of itself. Um, I wanted, you know, I have a video background, so, you know, I wanted something that was sort of graphical and sort of would speak um, to history. Um, and, um, and so we developed this, and I was very blessed in the early years. Um, at the beginning, uh, a, a company actually donated the creation, not of this one, this is the sort of the second iteration. Um, but a lot of our back-end development uh, was done um, out, actually outside the country in India. Uh, but it was very well done, and so we've been able to sort of add to it. We were getting 1,000 hits per month when we first started, and now we're getting 2 to 3.5 million hits per month with no promotion. Um, this is a look at, you know, our, you know, uh, a typical uh, page of our um, uh, site. Um, you'll see there's a biography section. Um, we actually are, um, as I, this is, uh, we have users from 100 foreign countries with um, United Kingdom, the Netherlands, and Canada um, being a part of the top users. Germany also fits in there. Actually, last year, Lithuania was in there, and we could not figure that out. We were wondering if there were some black Lithuanians. Um, we got, but we have also visitors from 100 foreign countries and uh, universities. Um, school districts have um, taken to this, um, and some of them, like Lexington, Kentucky, have adopted it. Also, we found government agencies are looking at us, and also news gathering um, organizations like WGN, CBS, ABC. The BBC just contacted us. Um, and people, we actually were just recently rated by uh, Google as one of the top um, eight sites for African American history. Um, the challenges to what we're doing is, you know, the processing and development, and I could talk a lot about that, but it's complicated. Uh, funding, organizational development, and outreach and promotion. Um, the processing costs, it's very expensive. The cable industry actually has an oral history project. Um, they process 90 hours of their collection using a software called Virage, and it costs them $100,000. Um, and if you embark upon something like this, you have to understand the cost, but there are tremendous rewards, and we're all learning in the process. Um, now, what is a digital archive? Um, Basically, what we have, or what Carnegie Mellon has uh, um, developed, is something that uh, is, is, is a searchable um, archive that's similar to a web-based search. Uh, what we can do right now is similar to a Boolean search, and like I said, um, we have this grant that we got from the Institute of Museum and Library Sciences that has uh, allowed this uh, collaboration between us and Carnegie Mellon. And so we will be processing 400 interviews, um, 3,600 hours of our video by the end of uh, next year. Um, I'm going to go to, um, instead of showing it, this is what our vision is, is um, right here in terms of it being accessible to libraries and organizations around the country, which is essentially what the, the Shaw Foundation has all also envisioned, and I think some of their material has been made available at the Hol Holocaust um, Museum. Um, I'd like to, I, I don't need to talk about, but I should mention something. Partnerships are extremely important. This is not something you do by itself um, with, um, um, with no input from other people um, for a variety of reasons. Um, you need information from people. The community itself has to help in the gathering of that information. Um, you need the processing. You need young and you need old. Um, you need young people because they know technology. You need older people because they know the history. 
Um, our staff is small. We have a full-time staff of eight, part-time staff of five, five people on our board of directors. We've been able, we have a great advisory board and scholar consultants, some of the nation leading um, 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 African-American subject matter specialists are involved with us, like David Levering Lewis, who's a two-time Pulitzer Prize winner. And, um, um, and Darlene Karkheim, who's especially in African American female history. And then we've been blessed with a wonderful group of volunteers. I'd like to just take this um, while I'm doing show and tell, and I want to um, show our um, digital archive technology um, here. Okay. I had put in home, but I would like someone just to give me a search word. I don't care what it is. Field. Field? Field. Okay. Now, imagine this. In the past, um, um, if you do a project like this, and if you go to look in any existing um, oral, oral history archives, they're going to basically say, you know, you want to know about this subject? Here's the catalog. Go for it. You got to look at all, you know, four or five hours or whatever. And hopefully, and I think someplace in there, someone mentioned something about field. But with this new technology here, um, we can. Can you hear it? Yes. Okay, great. Sorry. And suddenly they <clears throat> went in and flung, flung on gas masks. So what this essentially flung allows is um, the red marks yeah, indicate where field is point. actually mentioned. Uh, um, people started screaming. And educators have been very interested in this because they even say that it will help people, you know, even teach people how to read because the marker moves along as people are talking. Now, this came up with 78 results. Um, one of the things because... Sorry. Let me do this. And little kids like one... Okay. Um, Professor Walker, he had been doing a lot of work, you know, with CNN uh, footage, um, and so it's more moving image instead of talking heads. Um, but he did some interesting things with timelines, so we've taken those, you know, sort of 78 results, and it shows where people have talked about particular, um, you know, particular uh, time periods. The other thing is that it shows with these yellow markers who's talked about her um, um, house or Congress, um, Alvin Poussant there, um, Harvard there, um, and it can pinpoint things. And the fa fascinating thing about this is it does the machines do it all automatically. Um, the other thing is that they, because they had done a lot of work with CNN, uh, footage. It showed exactly where people were talking, um, you know, what parts of the, the world that they were talking about. Um, what this does for us, and for anyone involved in this, you know, you can turn on the lights. What, the, what this does for us, or anyone involved in this type of technology, is it opens up things in amazing ways. Um, I, I would like to, because I was not able to show um, my video, I would like to just share some stories with you of interviews that I have done. Um, I don't know how many of you here um, have done any genealogical research. Can I see a show of hands? Um, how many people have family reunions on a regular basis? How many of you would consider yourselves experts in your family history? Not good. I mean, some people would say that history was created last night, you know, in many ways. Some people would say that the making of history is a conscious moment, and others would say that they don't know and don't recognize, but only in hindsight, that something that happened sort of changed the course of history. 
Um, I can't, you know, as a young person, I had really very little knowledge of our history, you know, African American history, and in many ways, what we're doing at the History Makers is trying to mainstream one of America's little known um, history. I often, um, and I was talking today about the uh, Freedman's Bank, um, and that's uh, something that um, I became aware of uh, by work that had been done uh, by the Mormon Church, um, who are sort of experts in genealogy. And right after um, the freeing of the slaves, um, two abolitionists out of New York started something called Freeman's Bank because at that point in time, African Americans or former slaves, no one would want them to have their money deposited in their bank. The interesting thing about the Freedmen's Bank is that $70 million were deposited by the former slaves um, over a nine-year period. Um, now, it took, if you think about that, how were slaves actually, because if you sort of calculate the number of deposits um, that were made and, um, and look at um, how many people made them, the average deposit was about, a, you know, $1,000. Now, a lot of people say, well, now, how did former slaves even have an average deposit of $1,000? Well, some of them were people who had actually fought in the Civil War. Um, others were craftspeople, you know, and what they would do was that their owners, the slave owners, would rent them out and, uh, or allow them to make money. And so while they were, you know, working for free here, they would go over and make some money, maybe sort of a cut rate, and people saved and accumulated. But the thing, the sad thing about the Freedmen's Bank, it um, was one of the bank's debacles because um, there were these two brothers out of Washington, D.C. that got control of the bank. And they literally used that, those monies as their sort of playground. And when the bank was about to go under, um, the, um, they got Frederick Douglass and made him president of the bank. And this would be a big thing in the black community for a black man to be president of the bank. And the bank went under. And I often, you know, think that maybe that story tells a lot of stories. Maybe it tells the story of why black people were sort of afraid of banks after that, or institutions in that way. Um, so that's, you know, that's a particular interest of mine. I also have an interest in the 1700s in this country and what that history represents, because we don't know that history as it relates to black people. We know the history um, we know some other parts of the history, but we don't know about that history. We know about the antebellum South, and that's the history that we know. And when you really think about it, we know a little bit about Reconstruction. Historians are just getting around and doing some really important scholarship around Reconstruction. But what about the period from Reconstruction to the modern day Civil Rights Movement? We know about the Harlem Renaissance, a lot written about that. We know about A. Philip Randolph and, you know, the labor movement. And we know about the modern day civil rights movement, but I even have a fear that what we will know in years to come is Martin Luther King and his I Have a Dream speech, which is really a sad statement. And maybe we go to 2050 and he won't even be black. You know, he will be a man, the great man who did something and died, and that may be the story. So what is the interest of people, a diverse audience like this in this history? What, what, why should you be interested in it? One, we, you know, I think that there's a lot of guilt in this country about our, our history and this, this part of it. Um, it's interesting when the Smithsonian was getting ready to embark on the, tel of the slave narrative project, they were a little nervous. I mean, how were people going to react to, you know, slave history? And so they, they, they made it, um, they commissioned a study. And so they went to um, uh, white people, and white people were like, look, look, my people weren't part of it. You know, we, we didn't even come over at that time. We weren't there, you know, don't bring that to us. They went to black people, black people were like, look, I don't want to talk about it. You know, that's over. My, you know, I don't want to be part of it. So <clears throat> there's a lot of guilt in this country about this, this particular history. 
But what we have found as someone doing these interviews and my staff, we sit and we are amazed day after day of the, of the stories that we are cultivating and we wonder why certain people in the community have been silent so long. In many ways, we feel that the black community, and I will contend they don't feel that they have a history. And if they have a history, it's not a positive one. And so, you know, the Shaw Foundation said that they had to pull, in some cases, people out to tell the Holocaust story. We feel that we have to do that. In the ideal world, I would have been in a cave, you know, the imaginary world. We would have been in a cave building our database, and then people would still be alive, and we can do it in methodic fashion. But we also are in a race against time, especially when you look at 20th century African American history. And what we're finding are just some amazing stories, stories of how people came into this country. You know, there, there was a movement of people from the Ethiopian region through the Caribbean up. You, you find stories of blacks helping whites, whites helping blacks. You find stories, if you ask any African American right now, almost anyone, you know, do they have American Indian in them? Yes. What is it? Cherokee. You know, there's this whole thing of, you know, why Cherokee? Because, you know, there weren't that many Cherokee Indians. But some people say, you know, historians say, you know, that it's, it was a nice sounding name, you know. We're not sure about where that comes from. Um, there are people, you know, that I've interviewed, like Catherine Dunham, who found a black dance in this country, you know, who got her PhD um, back in the 1930s, and, and is, you know, and, and right now she is planning her, you know, 100th anniversary celebration, you know, back when she starred in Cabin in the Sky, Valentine and short her legs a quarter of a million dollars. Um, there are, you know, stories of William Hudgens, who founded the Freedom, uh, the Freedom Bank um, in New York, who had a wig manufacturing company with exclusives of China back in the 1930s and had pictures, you know, of mail orders coming in and then, you know, people start wear stop wearing wigs and they're in his, you know, business. Um, there's Alonzo Petty, who was the oldest living black cowboy. <laughs> it was so funny. From, he since passed, and that actually when he died, uh, he was written up in the New York Times. But that day when we arrived, he looked like a total, you know, cowboy. And he was like the typical cowboy. You know, we do these interviews, we sub these lights, and he's like drawing the dividing lines on the ground. And going, Mr. Petty, can you look up here? Um, there is that process, you know, in this, the process of discovery that occurs time and time again. Some of these memories are painful to people. They have not talked to them, talked about them. There's Roy Wilkins, who is a well-known journalist, who was the first African American to serve on the, the editorial board of the New York Times and the Washington Post. He <coughs> talked about his father and missing his father, and he had a horrible problem with alcoholism because of that disconnect that he had lost his father at an early age. We are finding this history in amazing, amazing places, and it's, it's so rich and contextual, but we really ultimately need everyone's help. And I'm sure here in Des Moines you have a history here that we would be interested in recording also. But back to this whole thing about guilt. This history is not so much about black and white, but a lot of shades of gray. I mean, amazing shades of gray of people that have helped, people that have hurt. Yes, African Americans suffered a lot. But in many ways, you know, we have helped build things. And I say that a, a, a society that takes from one of its people and doesn't recognize their contributions is an unbalanced society. And I say that unless you acknowledge without taking back, because we'll acknowledge that, oh, maybe, okay, Kim Burns did, you know, the series on jazz, so, oh, yes, that's okay to say that black people helped in the creation of jazz. But there are other things that people helped, and there's, and the fascination that we find with people once they hear these stories is changes the whole contextual and the approach of what we're doing. We, I, you know, 
I will take questions if you have them. There are a lot of things about my own personal odyssey. There are things about, you know, the new technology and the merging of traditional oral history with state-of-the-art technology. There are things about the interest in terms of biography, you know, and everyone sort of being a voyeur. There are things about, you know, where we're going, you know, as a country and where, you know, and will we ever meet our melting pot in many ways and, and reach our true potential as a country. But the bottom line is that at the History Makers, we are engaged in a process of trying to record this very, very, very important history before it's too late. Our 20th century African American history is dying off. We just did a program with Angela Davis. She's 60. She's 60. People think of her as the, you know, the rebel rousing, you know, Black Panther holding, like she was frozen in time. And so, you know, when we were doing her story, because I've been doing it in sections, she, when I told her, you know, we had already done four hours and, you know, we need to do a couple more, she's like, ah, and I said, but Angela, do you want people to think that your history ended with this? And so um, you have, there's been another 40 years involved in that. So I want to thank you all for coming. Um, check out our website, www.thehistorymakers.com. I encourage the Drake community to embark upon your, the recording of your own history here in all of its, you know, sense. The institution, I'm told, is 125 years old. There are a lot of, a lot of, things that are, are actually occurring around that 100 period, especially also in the African American community. It was an interesting time in our history. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes. Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, we have not, um, right now we've been so busy trying to record um, um, because time is not on our side, but we see this um, as a body of work that will be of interest to authors, to playwrights, um, and we see that all as, as, you know, part of public history. Um, so we see ourselves part of oral history, but we have not done anything uh, yet. It really, the thing is, is that right now, um, I can talk to you as I've told you some of the interviews I've done, but we've done, you know, we have like 3,500 hours. So it's be becoming increasingly hard to, you know, I'm asking, you know, several of my staff people, do you know, of, you know, a story on this or that? Once we get this, this, um, this technology in the archive process, it's just a case of tapping in some keywords, but that is a complicated process. We do transcripts for each interview. The interviews have, the transcripts have to be read for accuracy. There are a lot of, it's a very laborious process. But if you do it and you do it right, you have a resource that is unparalleled. Any other, yes? Yes, actually, um, Alila Bundles is her, um, her granddaughter, and she uh, wrote a book, and we interviewed her. And, and, you know, in some cases, I mean, she has had some, you know, she has ha had an amazing story. Uh, Madam C.J. Walker, I actually knew, because um, I had done a lot of research on the Harlem Renaissance, but I didn't realize as a young person doing that research that I knew the end of her story, you know, doing salons in New York uh, with all the artists, but she actually had a whole career in Indianapolis, um, and I can't remember where she was from before that. But her history runs in tandem with the Negro Women's Club's movement, um, and is a very, you know, important part of our history that is not uh, known. Any other questions? Yes. Okay, we don't cut out, um, but that's an interesting subject. Um, it's very important. We have yet at the History Makers to come up with an ethics policy, but it's something that I'm bound and determined to have. Um, understand that all histories have really been the province of, you know, academics, and while there was a format and approach to it, it's something on one hand that historians have claimed, you know, 
what is the historical value? Because there's a lot of subjectivity. And sometimes when you're interviewing people, they don't remember details about their life. Now, me as an interviewer, I'm interested in opening people up. And I, we have certain techniques. You know, one of the questions we ask is, you know, what favorite, what I've made mandatory is what favorite, um, what sights, smells, and sounds remind someone of their childhood. Now, what I'm doing with that question is trying to take people back because we're interviewing people in their offices or homes, you know. But I'm trying to take people back to an early period of time to, so I can relax them and so I can bring back their sense of memory. Now, I want people to be disclosing. And I was telling the students earlier today, the hardest people that I've um, interviewed want are, are comedians. They are masters of hiding, hiding themselves. So they're not going to say things. And then you have some public figures, and politicians are the worst, but <laughs> they you know, go on their political speeches, and that's not what you're looking for. But the, the thing is, is that I have found that journalists and documentary film producers have a lot of uh, they have difficulty doing these interviews. Both of them have agendas. Okay, they have agendas meaning that you know a journalist has already decided what both of them have already decided what story they want to tell. So that's a different thing. So they come in and they're all cocky. You know, I can do this, and then they say, "Oh, well, it just seems like a little goosey goosey." But the thing is, is that you are after that prize, you know, and you're after the story. So with the whole thing of people not disclosing things, let me answer that question. You want, we want people to open up. We are not a Barbara Walters type interview. We're not trying to embarrass anyone. If someone says something is off subject, we won't go there. But let's say, you know, like I interviewed Marion Barry. You cannot interview Marion Barry and not ask about the crack cocaine incident. I mean, that is not the right thing. And historians will look at you and say you were crazy. You know, that was not a good interview. But we're not going to trick anyone or, you know, because we're trying to create safe places. Now, we have had a couple of people come to us afterwards, not well-known people, because we have people sign full releases. It's been sort of surprising, but we've probably, out of our 1,000 interviews, I've had two people bugging me, maybe three. They call me panic. Oh, I could have said this stuff. I want to do the interview over again. Or I don't like how I looked. You know, can you change my picture? And I'm like, you know, like how you look. And I said at the beginning, you know, we really don't, we don't, well, one, we don't edit. And two, uh, we don't like change, you know, interviews. But I don't want, I'm trying to, I don't want people to feel horrific about it. And what we found even with this technology is that we can hide parts of interviews. Because you don't want, you know, someone may be talking about another person. You know, they may, you know, uh, say something that is untoward. Um, I remember like the cable industry, they had this one um, interview, because Ted Turner is famous for spouting off. And it's been a Turner Bullock. And he was talking about the head of AOL Time Warner. Well, they knew, you know, I, uh, Vanity Fair came calling. They had heard about this interview. They were wanting to grab it. And the archivists knew that if they got it, their funding would like be. <laughs> so, so I don't know what they did. They may have said the archive wasn't processed, but they did not re release that interview. Sometimes what we tell people um, that we will seal interviews. Um, we haven't had anyone take us up on it, but we will seal interviews until they, you know, until a period that they say it's okay to be released. But you do want to protect the person in that way. I mean, I, um, you know, in our goal to try to get things out, and we just um, did a deal where there's a commercial entity producing a DVD series using our material. My concern was, you know, what were you going to use? How were you going to show it? You know, because we have, we really have um, an ethical obligation to the people who have stepped forward in that way. Is there another question? Yes.
Um, yes, okay, we are mainly doing searching out. We've had to do a lot of proving um, up to this point. Um, we, I have to admit my own personal prejudice. I have been a little um, I'm suspect about people who would sort of self-nominate themselves. Um, and so, but there have been two important exceptions and they came um, after we were featured in the New York Times. Um, there's a woman, she's actually featured in this newsletter. Uh, we did a public program on her named Jenny Lagan. And Jenny Lagan uh, was the most preeminent black tap dancer in the United States. Uh, she lives in um, Vancouver uh, now. Um, but she contacted me and said, you know, you should know about me, and I didn't know if she was legit or anything, but a BBC had actually done a documentary on her, and she is amazing. I mean, the thing is, is that probably anyone in this, every, probably everyone in this room who's seen old black and white movies, you know, with the black female tap dancing, or, you know, even singing, has seen Jenny Lagan. The audience was actually moved by her, um, and um, and it was it was one of these cases because there are times where you feel that you're really walking with um, history. So, in answer to your question, we are still trying to search people out, and we have a place on our website called Nominate a History Maker, and we've had some important nominations come out of this. We're really trying to make a collective process. But giving permission, this is a community that has not talked a lot. Uh, there has been, you know, in the, in the black community, often it was, you know, that's the thing of old folks. You know, that's none of your business, you know. And so we are trying to really sort of change that. We finally, just next week, I'm going to interview John Johnson, who's the publisher of Ebony. I've been after him for five years. And, um, and so, you know, even though he, you know, he told his story and things like that, and, you know, and some people who have told their story, the other thing is that we try to get other parts of the story. Like Gordon Parks, we know that he's, you know, a famous photographer, we know he's a filmmaker, but did you know Gordon Parks also played basketball? And he was known as Hurricane Parks. You know, so, so we try to, you know, get those stories out. But um, that um, we don't. We're sort of suspect of people self-nominating, not to mean that they, you know, they that they're not legit. Anything else? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes, the Radcliffe Collection is an important collection. Um, we have, we have not interfaced with it yet, mainly because um, the way, let me just talk about the way we could interface with it. We could interface, they did um, transcripts. Um, we probably at some point will approach them about having them, their collection as part of our, our collection. Um, but what we would be able to offer is the digitizing and being made part of a national project. Um, there's also an important collection at Fisk University. It's audio cassette interviews. Um, and uh, they have County Cullen and um, um, uh, um, Arna Bontomps and others. It's a very significant collection. And I've been talking to the librarian there who is still keeps trying to check if they can release things. I'm also interested in personal collections. Um, Josephine Baker's son, he's a little cagey in New York, but uh, there are people that have personal collections. He actually, after his mother died, went around interviewing a lot of black, old black entertainers like Bricktop and, you know, some others. And he's done, he says, about 100 interviews. I'm often wondering what condition, and I've been trying to get to him to see how he's keeping them. This is the whole thing. Video, <coughs> paper lasts the longest. Paper lasts, if it's, especially if it's parchment, parchment, hundreds of years. Film can last a hundred years. CD, D, CDs and DVDs last three to seven years. So if you are putting things on CD, ROM, and DVD, do not throw your source material out. I keep telling archivists they're talking to themselves and they need to talk to the larger community. You also, all this digitization that's going on, you know, computer files get corrupted, so you better have that source material. 
or those things won't last. Um, you know, often we're talking about, you know, how we're going around, you know, doing all the little digital photos. I mean, unless you put that on, you know, paper that's going to last, that is going to be gone. So <laughs> this, um, so I just, you know, want to sort of emphasize, you know, the importance of um, knowing that. But what was the question? Did I answer your question? Sorry. Okay, any others? Yes. We've tried. We have. <laughs> I know she does. We've tried. We really have tried. It hasn't worked yet. Yes. Um, we will, but you know, a project like this, you've got to be focused. Um, and lots of people want me to do lots of things, but I mean, I want to do stories. I want to record the stories, and I want to index it so it's easy to do. And that's the temptation, and people are constantly wanting me to do other things. And, you know, some people said, why do you want to do that 5,000? I mean, you know, just be happy with what you got. But the history is dying every day, and you know, and there's so much of it. Um, and you know, it's well. Anyway, it's pretty. It's a pretty a wonderful process. Yeah. Yes. Um, our um, average interview was three hours, and our longest interview to date is about seven. Um, and those, um, some of those interviews were done in sequence. I've done a couple that were six-hour interviews, you know, in one sitting. Like, I just interviewed uh, George Johnson. That's another interview I waited for uh, six years, four, I mean, sorry, four years to get. And he, um, and because I didn't know if I would ever get to him again, I don't know if people know George Johnson, but he founded um, Ultra Sheen and, um, you know, was the first black to open up a company on the American Stock Exchange back in the 1960s when he was making about 40 million a year. Um, that was before the majority uh, community got involved, you know, in the hair care industry. Now you have Revlon and places like that. But um, back to uh, your question about, um, um, you said, how do we edit? Or, oh, the preparation. Yeah, it's, it's very complicated. Um, you know, realize we pay people $150 per interview, both interviewers and videographers. And it, the videographers have to work really hard, because um, I, if you would see the video, we insist that it be done, look good. But the preparing is a very complicated process, because if we were doing subject matter histories and just one subject, then you would be, anyone would become expert. There's a real challenge, and you know, um, in the preparation. So I really insist there's several areas. Um, if someone has written a book or books, books are complicated, but you know, we want that person to read them and sort of be knowledgeable coming in. It's also the the ideal interview, though, is one where you do contextual history or research um, about periods, because historians tell us that we have to ask them about the time periods, you know, for it to have scholarly value. Otherwise, we have sort of just the thoughts and ideas about a person, and, and we're not getting the things that are important to historians. It's a very challenging process. Um, I, in some cases, I mean, my goal is to bring historians in. You know, it would be great if we could um, tie subject matter experts into them doing the history, but that has been problematic. I find also that everyone can't do an old history interview. It's an art form, and that is, you may know a lot about the subject, but can you get that person to open up? Um, it's, a, it's a skill set, you know. And, and so, because if you can't get them to open up, and if you're talking too much, or if you presume too much knowledge, I've seen people who come in and maybe they're interviewing someone they know, and then they won't ask basic questions. Um, and then there's also the thing of feel, not 
not feeling comfortable, and this happened a lot in the Shaw Project, people were not comfortable where people were talking about sensitive subjects. They would not take it the next step. But it is a very complicated thing, and it's the risk that we have. And because our interviews are now being looked at critically for the first time, and I did a lot of those interviews, I know I'm going to be, you know, under sort of a microscope. But I see not only a positive light, because it can only make us better you know, at the process. But, you know, so it is, it is a concern, sir, but we, I try to really emphasize that we, you know, that people do that and we're trying to look at our interviews some and critique people. Like, I had someone just interview someone who uh, started Network Solutions. Anyone who knows about the internet industry, it was one, a black guy um, named Emmett McHenry who was one of the partners. And I found out the other day that the interviewer knew nothing. I mean, this interview knows a lot of history. We knew nothing about the internet. And I said we would go back and actually redo that interview. So, okay. Um, that's okay. Yes, okay. No, ma'am. But I would be very interested in, in knowing it, yes. I would be very interested in doing it. You know, this is what is really fascinating about this project. I mean, when people, when you think, people think African American history, they're thinking New York, Washington, D.C., Atlanta. I have found some of the most interesting history in places that are not typically African American. And as you saw, as part of the Knight Foundation, we were in even North and South Dakota. So we were very interested in recognizing those parts of our history. And I want to thank everyone for coming tonight. And sorry about the technical difficulties. <laughs> Thank you, Juliana. That was wonderful. <laughs> and we have a little uh, gift for you. <laughs> Hold it up to us, Susan. Oh, that is, Sarah bought us like one of my favorite. Well, we're, we're, we recently acquired some, some posters, and we had them framed, and uh, we just kind of looked through them, and I said, Thank you. That would be. The only thing about this is we don't want you to take this back through airport okay, security tomorrow. So okay. we'll, we'll ship so it much. back to you. So thank you. I am so thankful. We met actually at an IMLS uh, conference where I was presenting, and I'm just so pleased that you had the foresight to allow me, you know, to be here and, and share the work that we're doing. And we hope that all of you will participate. And if you don't participate with us, I hope because I didn't see a lot of hands talking about, you know, knowledge of your history. I encourage everyone. It's really important to sit down with the tape recorder. Someone had told me they gave their mother a book. But to try to record the history, you'll find amazing things that you did not know. And it's very important for legacy creation. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I just have uh, just a couple very, very brief comments, because I know it's, it's starting to get late. And I, I think many of us were probably up pretty late last night, maybe, too. <laughs> And I won't comment any more about it. So. <laughs> when my colleague, uh, Claudia Frazier, and I heard Dr. Richardson uh, last year at, at the conference she mentioned in, in Chicago, I was very inspired. And I wanted to do several things. Um, I wanted her to come to Drake. And um, I was also very intrigued by the approach she was taking in her project to uh, to bring an important part of the American experience to us, combined with the use of, of access technology. And the reason that we were in Chicago was to attend a conference on digital institutional repositories. And to keep this story short, when we came back, we started to put in place the technology to do something like that here at Drake. And um, in addition to that, we've, uh, we've developed one of our very own librarians, Claudia Frazier as, uh, as a, a budding expert in the management of, the, of this technology. And she's recently been asked to speak at a, at a national conference in, in Boston. The repository that we're going to develop here at Drake is going to have two main parts to it. It's going to be 
one digital library for faculty and student research that is born digital here at Drake, and the other half of it will be for historical material that we capture and digitize that relates to the history of Drake and the Drake community. So we're going to have text, oral history, images, audio, video under one technology. I also wanted to make another announcement this morning, uh, this evening, I'm sorry. We, uh, we're getting close this morning. We recently received a major gift to undertake an additional renovation to the Coles facility. And that gift has been provided uh, by a very good friend of Drake, James uh, Jim Collier. Jim Collier. And we're going to, uh, it's going to allow us to develop what we're calling the Drake Heritage Room. And uh, believe it or not, there's a space right back here. <laughs> you walk through that little door back there. Um, and it's going to be renovated. And it's going to be a place where we can display material from the library archives and from across the institution relative to our culture and history. So we've got a couple things coming together here. And we're actually kind of calling this the Drake Heritage Initiative. We've got our digital repository with its historical piece. And we have a new heritage room that's going to be ready sometime next year. So um, and that's something that we're going to tie into the upcoming 125th anniversary of, of this institution. So you'll be hearing more about both of those things in the near future. But we're going to need your help to do these things. If you want to be a part of this project, if you want to assist us financially, or as Juliana has said, everybody has a story to tell. And we think everybody in the Drake community has a story to tell. We want to hear that as well. Um, but again, a lot of this started when we heard Juliana in her presentation in Chicago last year. So thank you for coming to Drake, Juliana. Okay. I also wanted to thank Susan Breckenridge of the library staff for helping to get this organized. And John, did you want to say a few words? I think you just said it. Okay. All right. Thank you very much for coming. We're going to have another one of these probably in the spring. So look for the announcement. <laughs>